Hello, bird nerds. It's the bird emergency. I'm Grant Williams. I am a bird nerd and I have special skills, as I've just clearly demonstrated, in (laughs) not a whole lot. I'm today speaking with another scientist, but a scientist who is now a full-time author, which is pretty bloody cool, I reckon. Former Queenslander, now denizen of Malaysia, and we've just had a nice little chat about flying into Malaysia. Daryl Jones, how are you? G'day, Grant. I'm brilliant, mate. It's fantastic to be on the show. Very fortuitous that I, I saw a tweet that popped up with the intriguing hook Corvus Urbanus. Mm. And I thought, mm. that's not one I know. I don't know that one. I will read further. And then I discovered that it's an idea, a, a treatise, shall we say, that you've been working on for a little while. I didn't know that this was had been a hobby horse of yours for, what, six years or so? Set, you've had to write it, so it's probably been eight to ten years that you've been yeah, thinking yeah. about this. That's right, absolutely. That urban birds, yep. ACH, they are evolving before our very eyes before to possibly become eye. new species. Mm-hmm. And you did your study on a crow, but I think we can overlay this to a heap of birds. In the Australian context, no better example than the white ice, the bin chicken, I would say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How did you get interested in this whole idea? I've been an urban ecologist my entire career. In fact, I did my honours several centuries ago on birds in a small country town, my, my home country town of Wagga Wagga, and it was... As far as I know, it was the first study, a serious but limited small amount, small study on just birds in a city somewhere in Australia. So it was the, a very early version, er, example of urban ecology here in this place. But I've been doing that sort of stuff and plenty of other things as well for a long time. But I'm really interested in why some species, most animals can't cope with what we do when we turn the bush or a farm into a suburb. We just, they just can't cope. They can't cope with the change that's so pronounced and so profound and they just leave or die. But there's a small number, and they're the ones that I'm really interested in, of which birds that come back on their own terms and do bloody well. So they thrive on what we throw at them somehow. And, yeah, and the crow is a special example of, of what's going on there. So in, in the Australian context, the birds that first spring to mind when we talk about the birds that love to live alongside us yep. are generally introduced birds. It, in recent times, the rainbow lorikeet has probably become a really familiar part of our suburbs. But when I was a child, they weren't common in oh. the cities. The magpie lark or the mudlark or the peewee, whatever you want to call it, and yep. the Australian magpie, white-backed magpie in my mm. experience, and the mask lapwing or the spurwing plover were the common native birds Mm. that would Mm. exist alongside the Indian miner or the common miner, as it's known on the the Asian continent, and the sparrows and the starling and the European blackbird. We're of a similar vintage. Was your experience of the birds that you knew in your suburbs similar to mine? Absolutely. Now, don't forget, I come from the bush. I was in a, a smallish country town. In Wagga, yeah. In Wagga. And in fact, the new book, which we'll flog as hard as we can on this show, Curlews on Culture Street, that's, that opens with me as a 14-year-old. Um, Sorry, don't stop when I put up a picture. Uh, I, was right. just, I was just saying, there we are. We are going to be flogging books, all right? Of course <laughs> just so people get that clear. No, but this book that's coming out, which isn't the one that just came up here there, Curlews in, in Vulture Street, it starts with me as a 14-year-old seeing a blackbird on my backyard. And I think, a blackbird in Wagga, that's beyond comprehension. And I, was, I had, as I said, I went on and did honours on the birds that lived in my country town. And that was, as, as you say, starlings, sparrows, not blackbirds at that stage, they hadn't arrived. Tree sparrows were there, goldfinches, greenfinches, they were all there. And they were the dominant types of birds, and there was only a small number of really abundant native birds which were there at all. And there was certainly no rainbow lorikeets. And in the last couple of decades, the rainbow lorikeet has become the commonest city bird in, the, in Australia. It's every, everywhere, along with noisy miners. And so what's the commonality there? Nectar, be- nectar feeding. And so we put in billions of nectar-bearing plants in our gardens and parks and everywhere, and 
some nectar bearing nectar feeding birds have said brilliant that's just what we want let's go for it and they've really prospered now i know that that i rushed out a recording that i'd done with holly uh, and johanna martins a little while uh, about feeding wild birds now you wrote a book called the birds at my table which mm. i've been talking have been flogging a bit on on twitter do you have a view about feeding wild birds in localities that are not really urbanised. So we could be talking about country towns and the fringe suburbs of our major cities. I have a very strong opinion about all those sorts of things. Express okay. hit us. Now expressed most articulately and in detail in this in the follow-up book to the birds at my table, which is feeding the birds at your table, which is a guide for feeding birds in Australia. There, I've said it. I've said it. Feeding birds in Australia, is that even a possibility? This is the only place in the world where the mere suggestion of feeding native birds or any birds in your own backyard is anathema. It's the opposite of what's supposed to be happening, we were all told. So I've had to re readjust my thinking about that. I was the, in the string them up as high as we can category of anybody that fed birds my whole life until I started looking into it. And what I've discovered is that there's so many people feeding birds, so many people feeding birds, so such a huge proportion. It's around about 20 to 35% of every household in Australia, people are spending money on feeding birds in their backyards. And they're not going to stop. They're not going to stop. No. So did, did you listen to what we were saying and where we got to in our, in our conversation? Remind me of what your conclusion well, The conclusion really was that there are better ways to look after the birds that are around and that in a lot of cases the birds that are around don't need to be fed and that if you are supplementary feeding in the wrong way, such as how I was doing it, just putting out a commercial seed mix, yeah. that you can be introducing birds in into a location in a number which is far greater than they would otherwise be, which can mm. then drive other birds out. So that was one thing. The other thing was that depending on how you're feeding, you can be helping to tra to be, you're an aid to the transmission of diseases which are really bad for the birds that you are trying to help. Yep. And we talked about beak and feather disease because it was prior to the horrible avian influenza outbreak that a lot of the world is dealing with at the moment. And the context of that discussion, if you haven't heard it, people, just search to feed or not to feed with the bird emergency and you'll get it, the video or the or the podcast. It was it. During the pandemic, that I live across the road from a park and I mm. live in a unit, so I don't right. have a garden where birds come in and mm. feed on my grill or my mm. bottle brush or whatever. So I was feeding the parrots, the twos, the corellas, the red rumps and okay. whatnot. And in my area, the lorikeets aren't habituated to come down to the ground to be fed, so they weren't involved. But it was okay. a big flock of long-billed corellas. Now, since I've stopped feeding them, They've stopped coming to this park every day, yeah, yeah, but they're yeah. still around. Yeah, They yeah. don't need me to feed them. That was really yeah. the kind of point. Oh, I'll go here. Before we press go, I asked you about the cover of your book, mm. and it's one of the reasons why I'd never bought the book, but it ties in to, to the difference that we have in Australia, and I think yeah. you were alluding to, compared to Northern Hemisphere, yeah. where – Feeding takes place in a different way, mm. also with different things. Suet balls are a thing, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. And that in those highly urbanised settings in the UK, the US, Europe, Canada, obviously, where urbanisation is taking habitat away and feeding opportunities and where the bulk of the birds are migrating, those feeders are essential life-giving Oases in the desert for these migratory species. So I think that's one of the reasons why the attitudes are substantially different. Yeah. What well, do you think about that idea? No, absolutely. So that's there, there is a really, and in fact, I've 
written a paper about the contrast between the northern and southern hemispheres on this very very thing. I'll find I'll send you that paper and we can broadcast it around a bit. But there's a really big difference. The primary difference is those countries you just mentioned have terrible winters, really difficult places where birds, if they can possibly get out of there, they do. And they leave and they migrate to a sensible place where they can survive the winter. And then they come back when the conditions are a bit better in spring and breed back where they normally came from. But it's the birds that are left behind, which were the first birds that people started feeding because they it was primarily a humane gesture of poor, starving birds on the, the, the windowsill covered in snow. It was difficult times and so what you, what could you, how could you help them out? But that's changed things really radically. Probably the most ex- radical example is ruby-throated hummingbirds now overwinter in Vancouver because people have put out feeders, in this case a sugar feeder type thing, a nectar type apparatus, that now has a heater in it so it won't free. So you've got hummingbirds in the snow, insane, completely ridiculous. And that's just one example of birds that have stopped migrating because they don't need to. They don't. They've, there's plenty of food for them, it seems, back in the wintry places and they don't leave and go back somewhere else. And there could be another aspect to that too, is that maybe as the climate is changing, maybe the migration that they undertake is actually too harrowing for them and that where they used to go to to get refuge from the bitterly cold winters may be becoming too hot. Maybe not the final destination, but maybe the places that they are moving through have become... Uh, nutrition deserts for them. Who knows? So maybe sure, it's sure. actually coping mechanism that is a very smart one for those birds. There, there is an adaptive element to that for sure. The winters are getting less severe, so there's less push, if you like. And so there is a bunch of species, especially in Europe, which where they've been studied a bit more. The black throat is, no, the back, black cap is one of them, which no longer does the big migration down into Spain and North Africa. Lots of them now just stay in Europe because it's not so cold, plus there's tons of food available for them for the people who, by the people who are putting them out. So that's the very North America, North and Northern Hemisphere perspective. Let's go back to the, story, the questions you asked can originally. I, can I just stop you there? Hold that yep. thought. The bird watcher in me yep. says, oh, those birds sticking around, that's great. But their creatures don't exist in isolation. So there may well be vegetation communities that need those birds to pass through. Pest control, pest management, mm, mm. be it for people or for ecosystems, yep. may need those birds to pass through. Sure. Raptors in different areas and other predators may need those birds to pass through. So the point is we can't look at any of these things in isolation and we need to be cautious about being either critics or cheer squad members for any of these changes and the actions that people are taking. Absolutely, Um, yes. My my take is if you're feeding birds, you think it's just my backyard, it's not a big drama. But when you think about that three or four of the ten houses in your street, it's probably happening as well, then it becomes this ecological experiment on a global scale. It's absolutely massive. The the, The amount of food that's put out in the Northern Hemisphere especially is utterly, un- it's impossible to comprehend how much there is. It's just, it's enormous, and yet all of it is eaten. All of it gets eaten, and that has enormous impact on all sorts of things. There's just no way. That's really what that book, The bird, the Birds at My Table, was trying to get at. It was, I'm, I might be feeding the birds at my bird table just in my backyard. I don't think about it beyond that. But on a global scale, the ecological impacts and implications are massive, and that's what that book explores. It looks at the whole global side of things. Now, before we move on, let me do the ad ad for you. That is the Australian version of The Birds at My Table, which you call Feeding the Birds at My Table. Now, that's still available and in print, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's sold extremely well, absolutely. And thinking about, we talked about before we went on the air, the inappropriate species that were put on the cover of the Blue Book, which is the birds at my table, pigeons and a raven and a crazy stuff that never goes. European magpie. A European magpie, absolutely. I don't think there's going to be a huge number of bird feeders in Australia that, that get a pink cockatoo on their, a major Mitchell on their feeder. And that's on the, so that's about marketing, not about re- reality. 
But isn't that interesting that why wouldn't they have picked a Laura Kate or a King Parrot? They just had a nice picture. <laughs> the marketing people just took over at that stage. Yeah. But but originally it was going to be a sulfur crested and I went, you must not put a sulfur crested. <laughs> no way. No, it's amazing. What's the problem? So they soon learned that there was a big problem. Yeah. Let's do a bit more marketing. On for this book, is there a code or anything like that? Is there any way someone can snag a discount at uh, New South Books, isn't it? That are selling that one. Yeah, yeah. and it's it's available pretty much everywhere. I suspect there's going to be a a deal done. They haven't announced it formally, but I suspect there'll be a deal done when the new book comes out because it's special. It's this book, yes, this one, Curlews. So we've got a nice pink and a nice blue. There'll probably be a deal done to get both of them at the same time, I suspect. So keep your eyes out. I always advocate going to the book, the publishers to buy your books. If you can't, go to the local bookshop. Yep. Go to the book, local bookshop first. This is where you go second. You know, you know that the pedants are going to be throwing rocks at me now, saying that's not a curlew, that's a thick knee. <laughs> that's a civic provocation that I want people to <laughs> notice if that's the case. In the first sentence in the book, I say it's actually a stone curlew, and so that's you know, right. no, but that's if it, it's there's no any publicity is good publicity, basically. Yeah. Well, that's that's correct. That's correct. Good. I'm glad we got the ad out of the way. Your publishers can be happy and they can put me on their mailing list to review any future books. That would be really nice because I'd love to do it. But no, I cannot possibly afford to go and buy all the new <laughs> books I would like to talk about. I reckon I can talk them into sending you a copy of that one. That's for sure. That would be fab because this is what it's all about. We want to share yeah, the good stuff out there, that's out yeah. there and steer people towards the good stuff so that they don't buy the crap that's on the discount tables uh, when they go shopping. Yep. Okay, let's get back to this idea of urbanisation. Now, I read the paper from, what was it, 2016, and I had a bit of a giggle because in in the introduction, right at the start when we're talking about what you said, there are clocks, which made me giggle because... Maggie Watson in an earlier episode had talked about a Klein and people have said to me, what's a Klein? Here's my first question. What's a Klein? Put your ecology professor hat on here. I know, absolutely. Now, it's some. It's trying to get across the idea that there would have been an original corvid, a black crowish look, looking bird that's diverged into, a, into five separate species in this continent and that they're all closely related. So it's a, it's... It, the implication of clade is closely related. They're not, none of them are that different from each other. They would have split only not that long ago, so there's hardly any difference between them. Now, for talking about uh, Corvus, and you just limited it to Australia, but I want to broaden it out a little bit for, the, for all of our audience. Crows and ravens are pretty, pretty similar. They're in the same evolutionary branch. Yep. In Australia, we've got horns. Yep. How close are they? To They're not that close. So Kar- so you let's go with Karawong and Butcher Birds. They're, they're yes. two big groups. So they're cl- yep. those two, the Butcher Birds and the Karawongs are very closely related. They're not that close to the crows. They're, that's they're not that close at all. And in fact, you now and I know, where does the magpie come in? Well the magpie these days is just the big butcher bird. It's just the biggest the butcher bit, bird. Okay, because yeah. that was my next question. Yeah. Where are we putting the Australian well, magpie? It is a butcher bird. It's just straightforward okay. down the line. Every All the things, it's one of those butcher birds. And the Karawong is closely related to it, so they're very similar. But they're not, despite appearances, they're not evolutionarily that close at all, really quite different. Okay. Uh, let me, sorry to always do this, but where do the Kongs fit if they're not that closely related to uh, well, you're saying they're not that closely related to the corvids, true corvids, corvids. or are they not that closely related to pies and butcher birds? Not very closely related to the butcher birds, that okay. group, that big, very Australian group. But they're, but neither of those two, so they're, they're sister groups way over to here, they're fairly distant from all the corvids. And we okay. probably and should then go, course, okay, so in Australia we've got crows and ravens and we don't think yep. much more. Yep. But elsewhere in the world, such as where I'm at the moment here in, in Kuala Lumpur, there's all sorts of others, and in well, Europe there are jackals and there are yeah. right bees and all sorts of things. Let's get there in just a minute. Sure. The next question, based on that 
evolutionary treatise that we that we've just given. Given the theory that songbirds and that's loosely passerines originated in Australia, yep. does that which is older, the butcher bird magpie Corowong lineage or the corvid? Lineage. No, the butcher for sure, absolutely. Okay. They're, they're fundamentalist Aussie or Gondwana, really. Uh, not so, much. so the rest of the world can thank our amazing magpies and quirky ones yep. for the joys of the other corvids, the jays, the European magpies, and all of those birds. Yes, they, like, they can't thank us. They can, if no. they're going to thank anyone, they can thank the the original Australians. Quite, yeah. It's NAIDOC week too, by the way. Happy NAIDOC week, everyone. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yep. Yeah, and in fact, we and we can personally thank Tim Lowe for bringing this together in his yes. wonderful book, yeah. the, the song where song began, which is all about that that very topic. Yeah, and that's yeah. that has been sticking in the craw of many people in the northern hemisphere who always assumed that all good things, cultural and otherwise, came from Europe. And this is turning that completely on its head. But I, yet, uh, I, I interviewed David Tan, who's a right. Singapore native, who is studying ornithology in where is he in, in Nevada or Arizona? I think he's in I think he's in Arizona. But his special interest group is pitters, and we were talking about migratory birds. Yeah. And because he was a Northern Hemisphere guy, I thought I'd ask him what's older, where did they all come from? And he just said Gondwana's. Australia, that's where it all began. <laughs> Fair enough, good idea. But it's amazing how rarely when I speak to bird nerds, ornithologists yep. and ecologists from the Northern Hemisphere, where they have flipped their perspective around mm. about where mm. where things originated. Yeah. non pass did they also evolve here, I know it's off the track, so if you are watching and listening for this, sorry, but I can't let the opportunity go while I've got Daryl here and we're tuned in on this. Do you reckon, did birds evolve in Gondwana or uh, what was the pre-Gondwana grouping of the continent Ooh. down here? Or is there was there simultaneous evolution happening from different branches of dinosaurs? It's a huge question there, way beyond my... Well, what do you think? <laughs> no, I can, what I can say is the songbird, perching birds, little birds, bush birds that we often think about, and probably the magpie is about the biggest one there is, all those little songy birds, the beautiful things that sing nicely and all that sort of stuff, they're the passerines. That's just one group. We, along with the passerines, there are, I think we're up to 14 different other groups. Birds of prey, the ducks, the everything else is also in big groups. And so it's impossible and probably not even sensible to say where did they all originate because they originated everywhere. Everywhere. So, so a good example of a marine bird that did ex- originate in Gondwana slash Australia, the southern continent, is the ratites, the emus and bullies um, and cor- all, all of those. They originated in that part as well. Now, is... It- does that include the rails? Because are, are the rails outside of Galignols nowadays? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And they're ancient. No, I haven't got a clue where they come from. They're very old. They're very old. We are getting so meta here. I know. Some, there's, there's going to be some actual evolutionary biologists out there shaking their head and thinking, who the hell are these guys? You know? Yeah, who are these clowns? Our names are down there. That's who these uh, clowns are. It's not hard to tell. I'm, I'm expecting plenty of emails after this. All right. Now, I, I want to come back on to a definition that I was reading in that paper, which can probably get us way off into the weeds again. Neophobic. Ah, I knew it would be that. Yeah. Functional and intrinsic. Neophobia just means fear of new, anything that's new. Fear of the um, new. Fear okay. of the new, and, absolutely. In fact, there are plenty of people you could say are neophobic, for sure. I'll, now, I'll put it in context for the people yeah. who have just joined in. You were talking about how the crows that you were studying, and they were the Terasian crows, reacted to something new being introduced into their environment like a twig, which is what it, mm. you were talking about. So how did you test this? To save people reading the article, you did 65 tests, there were control tests, background tests, novel tests. Tell us how you tested how a crow reacts to a something new 
in yep. their environment. Okay, so this was a uh, this was Matt Brown. He did his PhD on these crows. So the crows that we studied were the ones that lived on the campus at Griffith University in the middle of Brisbane, which is a fantastic place to study them. But like crows everywhere, they're unbelievably difficult to catch or anything like that. So we were he was particularly interested in their cognitive abilities, how, if you like, how smart they are, what do they how do they learn, all that kind of stuff. Because this is part of their success story. They're one of these big brained birds that learn quickly, have very good adaptations to change and all that sort of thing. But if you compare a magpie and a, and, a, and a crow, a magpie will just go bowling straight in, get whatever it is and fly away or get killed in the process. A crow would never do that. A crow will see something different, think, is this an opportunity that I can benefit from? I'm going to just watch a bit. I'll watch especially if some other donkey bird goes in and goes there first. Oh, no, they got into a bit of trouble. I'm not going anywhere near. I'll just keep watching. They are risk-averse but they're learning all the time and they're always thinking about what they can get out of something if there's something to be got out. And that's really the, one of the secrets for their success. So we had trained, if you like, these crows to come down eventually to get a, just a, a little ball of mints and they became really used to, we put out the ball of mints in a certain location. We did this with all the different, seven different pairs that lived on the campus and they all eventually got used to seeing us arrive and we'd put down the ball of mints and that was fine. They got a nice little snack out of that. And then what we did was we put something completely different and utterly benign, not a rabbit trap or a, something garish and possibly dangerous. We got some blue tack and put some twigs in it and just it was just a strange-looking thing. But twigs are everywhere. There's nothing special about twigs. It was just a slightly different arrangement of twigs. No animal in the world would think that there was a risk there. Crows did. They just went, what is that strange thing over there near my beautiful ball of mints? I'm not going anywhere near it. And they, so that's, if you like, the simplified version of what's going on. How long did it take them to, they would approach, we would say, when they got within a certain distance from the bait, we would then record how long it took them to do things. And so we, if you like, quantified their neophobia, their fear of this new thing, by how long it took them to go to the mints without the new thing there. And then we changed how many different new things there were. And some new things they never got used to. They did eventually get used to the twigs. I think that twig hasn't moved for four days. Maybe it's safe after all. That's how crazy they were. And so we, so that's how we did it effectively. How long did it take them to get used to this new thing? Did you discover amongst that population, and it's small, yeah. okay, so it's difficult to extrapolate further, but were there bolder individuals? Were there more inquisitive yeah. individuals within yeah, that cool. small population? Definitely. And the problem was we always speculated they looked a bit sleeker, they looked a bit brighter of eye, you know, they just looked a bit younger. But we would never know because you, once they mm. get to about two and their eyes change to their final colour, you cannot tell how old they are. And we couldn't catch them. And we, in fact, we had decided that we weren't going to catch them. I've, done, I've been working with crows for 30 years. As soon as you catch them, the trauma of being caught to ban them means that you'll never be able to go anywhere near those crows ever again. They'll recognise you. It's, they're, they're out of the system for good. And that's really frustrating for an animal behaviour person. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's interesting that you mentioned that they recognise you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I've, got a local, I've got a local pair of magpies that nest in the tree directly across right. from my house, and they swoop most men. They do not swoop me. Okay, okay. They do not swoop the posty. They do not swoop me when I walk the dog, but they do swoop the guy two houses down when he walks his dog. And they don't just swoop him. They want to eradicate him from the face of the planet. <laughs> they know who he is and oh, they yeah. know who I am and they can tell the dog. Yeah. So this idea that birds all react in the same way to the just weird. Yeah, um, no, it, it doesn't give them the credit they deserve. Magpies, we've done a lot of work on this. We've actually proven that they can remember by their facial features because we wore masks and changed masks around and all that sort of thing. They can remember people's faces. That's how, like we do, by the arrangement of our nose and our eyes and all that sort of stuff. And they look, they, that's, they can look at a person's face and say, I know you. But also don't forget that the magpies that live across the street from you don't have a big range. They would see the same no. people mostly every day. And so they might live for 20 years, 
They would see kids grow up. They would see the same people going, coming and going all day long. They'd know you. They'd know the bloke down the road. They'd know who a stranger was as well if they came wandering through as well. Yeah. So they know those people very well. And, and they don't move. If it's all stable and nothing, there's no reason to move, those magpies will never move from that spot. So they know us intimately. Yeah. And so they decide, if they decide that you're a danger for some reason unknown only to themselves, then you're buggered because that bloke down the road probably ever, as long as those magpies are still there, they're going to hammer him forever. And that's. Yeah. And it makes me wonder what he, whether he ever did anything to provoke them because I'm always amazed that people will throw things at a bird like a magpie or a lapwing, a, a spurling yeah. plover or anything like that. I think you're dying with death. You're, you're asking for trouble. And in fact, with magpies, and if you live near them or they, you go to that place r- regularly, they're pretty much going to remember you for the rest of their lives. You've made a real rod for your back if you do something nasty to a magpie because they will remember. And it doesn't take – there's actually a, a, a really interesting anecdote that we I relate in that Curlew's book, which you've shown, about one of my research assistants who got recognised, yep, in there, the chapter on magpies. The Magpies on Shottery Street is the name of the chapter. And those magpies remembered Nick Salento, who was my research assistant for years and years. They remembered him 15 years after the first incident. And all he did was we actually said, he said to me one day, I reckon we could make a peaceful magpie into a, an aggressive one. I went, what do you want to do that for? And he said, "Some, not all magpies, the majority of magpies are never aggressive. 90% never attack anybody. We have to remember that's really important to know. So something changes in their behaviour. And they're smart birds, so they know what's going on. So all he did, this was just one mild experiment. All he did was go to a tree where we knew there was magpies. We knew the magpies had never attacked anybody, but there were chicks in the nest. And all he did was walk around the tree five times, looking up at the nest, yeah, behaving, yeah. I guess, like a predator, like a from, cat or a goanna. Yeah. We've seen a goanna in the area. Yep. And from that, only five trials, and he didn't even do anything. After that, they remembered him for the rest of his life. So they're smart, and they've got an amazing memory. Nick, I hope you're able to move away yes, and no, get some. Pain. He's worked out how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't become a postie. Would be my oh, advice, okay. Nick. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. You've got to know intimately these this population of crows and you've done these experiments. What did that, how did that experience, that experiment, lead you to this theory? Have we advanced it far enough to become a theory that, that yeah. urban birds are evolving into species? Is it an it idea been, or is it a theory? It's still a hypothesis more than a theory. There is a great book on this stuff, and it's not just about birds, it's about all sorts of animals that live in cities, called Darwin Comes to Town by a bloke with an unpronounceable German name. You can look it up, just Darwin Comes to Town, Google that. And he's got he's collated as many examples as you possibly can. But the ones that I got to know this, because I'm an urban ecologist, I keep an eye on those sorts of papers. And as well as the changing of most of it, it comes back to bird feeding in some senses because that's a big thing that humans do and have changed the environment, putting food out for birds. There's now extremely good evidence that great tits, the, the birds, have got smaller and finer beaks so they can get the seeds out of the feeders more efficiently than the birds that don't have the, they have a fatter beak. And so they're getting more food and therefore more nutrition from the feeders. And that's changed only in about 30 years. And that's one example of many other examples where there's been, I guess, physiological changes, physical changes that you can measure quickly in these sorts of things. So that was the background. I was becoming more and more aware of these, what was going on with urbanised birds and the ones that were living in the city. And you very rightly named the bin chicken, the white white ibis. There is now a profoundly urbanised inner city ibis which hang out in the CBDs and the inner city places, especially in places like the Gold Coast and Brisbane and Sydney, where they behave in a very different way. We looked at how many ways they feed, how many times they, in the different ways they use their beaks. And those birds can use, have thir- up to 35 different ways of feeding that a bird in the bush or out on the mudflats would never have to use. A bird on the mudflats never has to pick up a half-eaten hamburger and scoff it or steal chips from a toddler. These are all new things that they've come up with. Daryl, you grew up in the country town. I grew up in the country as well. I'm assuming that you've been on the Saturday or Sunday morning trip to the tip with the trailer. I don't think that this behaviour with ibis, straw-necked ibis and white ibis, is that new. 
I, I was watching it in the tip yeah. that I went to as a kid way before I ever saw it in the city. I wonder what came first. I reckon we've displaced the eye from all the places where they were happily feeding in on the fringes of dams and lakes and rivers and in wet paddocks eating crickets and everything, right. doing what they do yep. and going and having their treat at the municipal tip. I reckon we pushed them all out and then they've adapted what they learnt in the tips into the city. Discuss. Discuss. Okay. That doesn't seem to be the case, but it, what it does suggest to you is that intrinsically, white eye common Australian white eye, very adapted. And they're, they're smart. They're innovative. They'll come up with new ways. So, yes, sticking a beak into a tip is totally different from sticking it into a mudflat or, or chasing grasshoppers in the grasslands, definitely. So they've got that intrinsic ability to change and adapt and use, a, use their beaks in different ways. What's interesting to me is that you never see the strawneck divers, their close relative, ever doing anything like that. That you'd never see a strawneck divers on the tip. I, I used to. That was did why you? I referenced oh, them. Absolutely. Well, and, that's new to me. That's new to me. Okay. And uh, that was so exactly I, why I, I referenced them. That's interesting uh, because they haven't really become inner urbanised. That's it. And this is what got me thinking about it: is that we there's still places that I saw strawneck divers as a kid that. I still see them, but the white ibis seem to have gone. Like they, then oh. they would have been the more numerous right. uh, when I was a kid, but they're no longer okay. Uh, okay. the most numerous. So that that's what sort of got me interested in this idea of why did the bin chicken become a bin chicken? Um, Let me tell you, this is my this is a, a very important part of urban ecology. I think if you're going to there it is, pronounce that surname for me. Schultheisen. There we go. Schultheisen. Yeah, so, magic how that happened. No, what I was going to say was... What, what were we talking about? Black divers, white divers. Absolutely. So the fundamental thing, if you're going to... The one, there are, there's probably about six to eight characteristics that really successful urban species of any sort of wildlife have. And number one is losing their fear of humans. That you've got to do that. If you want to live in the city, scavenge in the bush, scavenge from the, in the parks, steal people's sandwiches you have to overcome what is probably a very important and very sensible fear of humans because they're not going to do you any good most of the time. But if you can overcome that fear, you've got a, a huge number of opportunities to, to do well in city environments, and that's fundamental. And that's one of the things that the white ibis have done and the strawnecks have never done. You, you could never approach a strawneck ibis within a couple of metres as you can a white ibis in the middle of the town. Now, another anecdote, when I was a, a young person, a child, I had the good for, fortune of meeting and knowing a well-known naturalist who was doing a project where he was visiting white ibis oh. uh, nests at a rookery yep. and spraying them under their arms so that they could be oh. recognised from prior to wing tags and, right. and whatnot. And on many occasions, I accompanied him on a paddle board where we'd paddle oh. out to we'd paddle out to an old Malaluka paper bark or something yep. on the fringes of this. We called it a lake, but it was essentially a big dam. Yep. And we would go to the nest and ring ring the legs of the chicks and spray adults and juveniles under their right. wings. Okay. Uh, in that whole rookery, there were cormorants. There right. were a couple of species of cormorants. There were cattle egrets. There were white egrets. Great egrets, intermediate egrets, little egrets in the Australian sense, and there were white ibis. There were no straw necked ibis. Okay. And came night herons that, mm, that were there. There were spoonbills, both Australian yeah. varieties, the yeah. spoonbilled and the yellow bill, the royal, sorry, and the and the yellow bill. But yeah, no, okay. I can't remember any straw necks. And I visited and did this for maybe four years. Right. So yeah, I can't. So I think that sort of, again, anecdotal but yeah. reinforces yeah. your point that Shawneck are less likely to to hang around with people. But then again, in the park across the road from me, it is visited when the crickets, the cricket yeah. larvae are by both white and right. Shawneck divers, never right. at the same time, though. Never at the same time? Okay. No, never at the same time. Uh, so well, we, not that I've seen. So they, those two species are dividing up because they have very similar tastes. And, yeah, that's interesting. I wonder whether we've got... Because we've got pretty good, that must be good, because the Macquarie Marshes people have been studying this for a long time. And the, the populations are, though it, you would probably think if you just went from inner city to inner city around Australia, you'd think white ibis are doing really well. 
they're actually their overall population nationally is plummeting. Which is what I was referencing earlier about. I think we're pushing them out yeah. from the regions. Certainly, again, it's anecdotal because I don't do enough trips along the same route often enough to reference other than from back in my memory. Yeah. But straw neck divers seem more common to me in the places that I go to that are not urbanised right. than they were when I was a kid. They were a bit of a novelty to see. Really? For someone who grew up in Melbourne, or right. actually I grew up in outside of Melbourne, but you always saw what I was. Okay. divers were a bit of a, a, a rarity south of the divide. So, Without data in front of me, I would say there were probably about equal numbers of the, those two species, and they were very – it fluctuated massively. You wouldn't see any ibis at all when I lived in Wagga in the Riverina. After a good season, or a – which happened frequently in when I was a grasshopper plague, they'd turn up like crazy they and they were always in. known as the farmer's friends in those cases. They both yeah. species would be involved. It was always my completely uninformed view, my opinion, that the white ibis seemed, in my experience as a youngster, that they were the residents and that the right. straw-necked were the ones that were moving about. They were the opportunists. So. I'd- yeah, I'm not sure whether that's right because I've just seen data only in the last couple of weeks which shows the extraordinary distances that both species are now mm-hmm. travelling. And I guess we've had this really weird wet couple of years which has disrupted everything. So previous to this, we were worried about drought across most of Australia. Now we're opposite, we've got the opposite problem where there's flooding and everything. But the water birth is probably doing so- very Thanks for that, because I did want the opportunity to let the rest of the world know that in in Sydney at the moment, they're having their fourth once in 500 year event in the last, what is it? Two years. Climate's changing or something. Yeah, amazing that. When will they do something about it, Daryl, I wonder? Crazy. Can we extrapolate your thoughts about and then we were just been talking about bin chickens. Can we extrapolate that across a starlings? Common miners, sparrows. It has to depend on whether they have changed a significant part of their behaviour in order to prosper in the city. So some birds, so there's a big thing with urban ecology. Can a bird or any sort of animal at all bring its own natural habits or behaviours and bring them or does it need to change them in order to prosper in the city? So, for example, brush turkeys is another species that I've studied a lot. They don't need to change anything. They just build bloody great mounds of anything. And they, whatever they do, they just they get non-discriminatory. So they don't have to adapt, whereas the ibis have, have absolutely fundamentally changed the way they feed in order to access different types of food. So there's a difference there. So I don't, for example, so to do use those two examples, I can absolutely see that the ibis are going to change. They, they could very well be the, you know, the urbanised ibis versus the non-urbanised ibis. But with the brush turkeys, they won't because they haven't had to change anything. So if you can, ch- if you change, if you adapt, you see an opportunity as an urban bird, you change your behaviour, and that re- that results in more offspring. Then those birds are likely to evolve into a different subspecies way down the track. And that article which you referenced to, which started this whole conversation off, was me saying, now that there are ibis, uh, no, sorry, now that there are Teresian crows or other types of crows nesting in city and nesting on buildings. The little bit of data I've got is that suggests that they are much more likely to survive a larger proportion of their young because the nest are on safely, not in a tree, but in a sheltered part of, the, of a building. They're more likely to prosper and therefore spread their genes into the next generation. So it's not at all difficult to understand or speculate that urbanised, that the building, build, you know, building nesting crows are going to leave more offspring behind. Those offspring will think that it's completely normal to build on a building. And that's, they will continue to do that. And so that they could flood the gene pool eventually with, the, with being the, the types of birds that nest on the buildings because they do well as a result. Australian example, again, yep. urban falcons nesting yep. in Melbourne is... And every other city in the world, just about. Yep. They don't, they, they haven't, that's a good example, Grant. They don't have to do anything. They're still nesting on cliffs, feeding on pigeons, and they don't have to do anything different. And now there's so many pigeons and so many cliffs available in all the big cities of the world that the peregrines are doing bloody well. They nearly went extinct with DDT back in the 60s. Yeah. Now they're back in big in, in business and, uh, and they haven't had to change at all. So they're one of the ones that un, are unlikely to become urban. So what did 
Are there any other Australian examples? Because I'm, I'm thinking about the birds that have become more common yep. in, again, my experience is mostly in Melbourne. Yep. I'm mid-50s. Now, on the geological time f- time frame, that's not even a fart bubble in a bath. But in our in the history of the Australian colony, it's starting to become significant. I rainbow leaves are the obvious one where they've become far more numerous. Silver gull would be yeah. another one, but rainbow leaves I don't think have changed. They don't need to change. They're just still sticking that funny looking toilet brush beak down into the plants that we've provided for them. So they don't but need silver to gull. Yeah. Silver gulls could be because they yeah. would have they'd, they'd be they'd be along the same lines exactly as the, what I've described about the foraging in ibis. They would have to do the same thing. They have to overcome the fear of humans. They've never eaten chips before, but now they've get them all the time. In fact, people feed them chips. What please what do that? Chips? Please don't feed chips, bloody well, gull. Tell tell the grandma and the kids not to feed bread to the ducks. It's it's a yeah. Lot. Well, it's the same kind of thing. Can what is it, panda or whoever, those people who make yeah. native formulas for the animal hospitals and whatnot, can you Wonder make it. a chip substitute? Yeah, a, a chip substitute and yeah. a, and sell them just in, through 7-Elevens and milk bars and coals and wool. You would be doing a no. massive favour no, no, to the country. Good point, Grant. I, know I didn't force you into this, but this is another great point. So I, we've talked about the benefits of what that an animal can get from living in, in the city with us. But there's some terrible risks, and one of the risks for all those things that we've just described, especially foraging, is that those animals might have terrible nutrition as a result. Hmm? You can't live on chips. Just ask anybody who's tried to live on chips. You can't live which, on chips. Which is why I am surprised that nobody has seen the opportunity. As you were just saying, what were the statistics again for people who were feeding wildlife? It's between 25 and 38% of, the, of households in Australia. Okay. So... Why would you not, as a food producer, be a snack food producer or anyone, not be marketing to between 30 and 40% of the population with a specific product that we have the technology to easily make, I would imagine? Here's a little secret just between you and I, and no one else is listening, Grant. No one else. Okay. There's a manufacturer out there about to put out on the market magpie meals. I think it's what that what's called. They're going to be artificial worms. I'm, exactly I'm, all, I'm always late to the party, mate. Oh, right. I was about to sell a great idea. Because one of the things, there's one thing I will tell people, and a lot of people who are listening to this, the 13 of them who are listening, at least three of them will be feeding mints to the magpies. That's something we, that the one big thing I've been trying to get across in the feeding arena is if you must feed, don't feed anything. Mince is a terrible substitute. No, and shout out to Claire Greenwell, Dr. Claire, who gave me the tip that if you feel like you have to feed your magpies or anything and that you were thinking about feeding some kind of meat that is human consumption, don't. Feed right. bloodworms. Okay. Get yourself a farm. Good idea. Teach the kids about gr- about reproduction and whatnot, don't do mealworms, do bloodworms, their shells and what and their internal duration, their guts far better represent a healthy diet for a a insectivorous and omnivorous bird. Yep. And that's think the, about that. At the risk of self promotion, and I wouldn't dare do it, but that book that you've shown up a couple of times, Feeding the Birds at Your Table, is full of practical suggestions about what you should feed this one. A guide for Australia, it's sensible. It's, as far as I could, proven what you can feed that isn't harmful to the birds. And we wouldn't want to do any self-promotion, Daryl, and talk about no, another one of your books. That's completely <laughs> road ecology. So this is coming out the same year, just a couple of months apart, these two. So that's my so, that's that road ecology one. I'm glad you're not uh, promoting any of these things. Yeah, no, I wouldn't dream of it. Look, I don't, I, I'm not above shameless self-promotion or the promotion of others as long as I think that what they are promoting is beneficial right. to. Someone had a go at me on Twitter the other day saying, you're not a journalist. And I said, no, I'm a bloody proponent and an activist. Right. I've never pretended to be a journalist, and I reckon a lot of journalists are really stupid. I reckon a lot of journalists are really good. But activist journalists should be upfront and say they are activists. I'm a bloody activist. I'm an activist for the birds 
and yep. for doing something about biodiversity and climate. And if you don't like it, piss off. There's plenty of other YouTube channels to watch Absolutely. and plenty of other podcasts to listen to. I'm an effing activist. End of story. Good on you. All right. Back to you. That's That's terrible news. This co- My computer's about to die. Oh, I no, think. he didn't plug it in. He I didn't plug it in. It in. His... And it's been, we've been more than an hour, mate. No one's going to listen to all of this. Mate. My stats show that when people start watching or listening, they listen to, on average, 95 to 100%. So well, there I, we go. I would have to say that I'm, I'm completely unbiased, but who wouldn't be intrigued by this conversation that we're having? It's fundamentally important and interesting all the way Well, through. if you're a bird nerd and if you're into wildlife, and I, look, you can generally put the theme, the attitudes that we're talking about, you can mirror it over other wildlife as well. So yep. if yep. possums are your jam, find yep. the healthy things to feed possums, yep. plant good things for possums, protect possums, koalas, emus, whatever it be. Absolutely. Brogas, whatever. Daryl, I think we're going to make sure we speak to you again. I reckon uh, we did... barely covered the scratch the surface on this, so mate, I'll be very happy to come back and talk about all and, sorts of things. And as regular watchers slash listeners know, my regular Monday with Holly, we try to focus on urban birds and talk to people who are working with wild birds in the urban environment. And that's certainly your bag. And as I didn't know, Holly well, so I think we can, uh, we can, we can make that happen. Now, All if right. you've got a few more minutes on your computer, I just want to let the people know yep. that be quick before the computer dies. If you've got a question or a comment that you would, a question particularly, if you want to put to Daryl while well, we've got him here, please don't make it. Where can I get your books? Yeah, Google, books. Dar- Google Daryl Jones author and find out all the books that you might be interested in and then go to your local bookshop. That's where That's to get it. his books. Couldn't say it better. The, uh, both of the new ones, the Clouded Leopard one and the Curlew's one, are both not actually in, on the shelves yet, that one. But, but what you could do is say, ah. Oh, Daryl Jones has got a couple of new books coming out. Are they both coming out through Cornell? No, this one. Okay, this one is coming out through Cornell. So you can go, when they go, we don't know that one, you can say, oh, Cornell University Press, Cornell Press. You can find it there. And for the curlews on Vulture Street. New South. New South Press. Or New South Books, I think it is, isn't it, actually? Uh, New South Publishing, maybe. Same, New same South thing. Publishing. So that's what you can tell the helpful shop staff at your local bookstore, who you must already know because you always <laughs> buy your books from your local bookstore, and you, you could do that. What else? What other things should we be thinking about if we consider feeding birds first in our all, home or in our park, Darren? First of all, do you really need to? Is there any reason to? But lots of people have the simple thing that they really want to be close up. They want to. The connection with nature is the big thing. I've become convinced about how important that is. So that's I've overcome my aversion for people feeding because I now realise that can be, especially during lockdown, that was a fundamentally important thing for lots of people, just being close to the animals. And you can get close to animals by attracting them in with some food. That's the first thing. So that's a good thing to like to be close to birds. Never too much. Never put out more than just a tiny amount. For them, it's a snack. You are never providing all the food that they need. That's no, no, nowhere in the world are you providing all new, the nutrition that those birds require. You couldn't. There's no way we could ever no. replicate what they get from their natural diet. So it's just a bit of a snack for them, and it's a wonderful encounter for us, and that's what you need to remember. Yeah, you can go and find this article at Culturico. I'll put links, obviously, Daryl, for that. That's right. That's right. Uh, Good on for you. that, worth a read, thought provoking. And if you would like to check out the thoughts that Holly and I and Johanna Martins had with Professor David Phelan from the University of Sydney Veterinary School about feeding birds, you can just search to feed or not to feed the bird emergency, or you can go to the bird emergency slash live and you can check out that discussion. Daryl, it's been great to internet meet you all the way from Kuala Lumpur, or not quite Kuala Lumpur, but close by in Malaysia. Yep. I'm looking forward to doing it again. Absolutely. I will be in town. That got me on a – I'll be promoting this this new in a fairly vigorous way, so I'll be in town at some stage. 
in Melbourne. Let us know with plenty of plenty of leeway, and perhaps we might, if the if the lurgy has disappeared uh, enough and it's all safe enough for all of us, we might be able to all get in the one place. Wouldn't that be amazing? That'd be fantastic. Uh, okay. That would all be right. great to sit around a, a table and talk about that eating while we're eating. Yep. Great. Magnificent. Thanks, Bird Nerds. I'm Grant Williams. This has been The Bird Emergency. That's Daryl Jones. Get the books. We told you where. Links will be in the appropriate places. Uh, Daryl, what's your Twitter? Uh, at Magpie, capital D, uh, M, Magpie Joan D. Easy. Yeah, easy. All the links will be in the description. Be Monday with Grant, Bird Emergency. See ya. Thanks for being with us.